We're in Genesis chapter 2 once again, having had a little break from our studies in Genesis because of Remembrance Sunday and a few other things. We're back in Genesis, completing our, our look at Genesis chapter 2 with the creation of Adam, and we're about to discover the plan that God has so that Adam will not be alone. God caused all the living creatures to come before Adam so that he would know and understand them and their nature, but also so that he would recognize that none of them were like him or were in any sense his equal. Let's take up the reading in Genesis 2 verse 20. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, are you feeling any stress at this point this morning? Are you feeling any pressure? Are you fanning yourself? Because you've seen the title for this morning's sermon, Sex in Paradise. Well, I'm going to make full disclosure. I've stolen that title 100% from that book I've been recommending that you get your hands on uh, in, in, uh, about creation, um, that really helpful book, uh, in in the beginning, is that what it's called? What's it called? The 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 the, the, the first the, ah, the first story, first chapters of everything. Thank you very much. Had a blank there, but my wife has just been my helper there. Did you see how she did that so neatly? She's been my helper. Uh, the first Genesis, the first chapters of everything, and there's a chapter in there called Sex in Paradise, and I'm largely not going to be talking about anything that I think you'll find hugely embarrassing today, because I actually want to spend some time reflecting with you on the whole matter of what it is to be male and what it is to be female, and on God's plan, God's blueprint for life. I don't think the church is, in any sense, obsessed with sex or with what people get up to in terms of their sexual expression and their sexual nature. It's often said that the church has hang-ups or that the church has obsessions. It seems to me that the opposite is, is the truth, that perhaps we don't teach and we don't disciple and we don't discuss these things in an appropriate way often enough. But our culture, our society, is absolutely sold on the idea that there's no fulfillment and no meaning to life unless people are expressing themselves sexually all the time in any way that they wish to. I think it's our politicians and the people who form our cultural ideas, our media, our educators, our filmmakers, our health service, that so often seem to be the people with an obsession, and particularly in the last few years, an obsession with particular minority forms of sexual identity and practice. We endlessly hear about LGBTI and some other letters added on to that. Just switch on the TV or the radio. It is impossible to avoid another sermon, another preach, another uh, version of the same never-ending sermon 
that equality and diversity means accepting and affirming anything from that spectrum of practice and belief. The Scottish government has decided in its wisdom to impose a fairly dangerous philosophy on all our schools. And uh, we're is great backslapping all round about the kind of queer theory that is being normalized and given to primary age children at a very young age and secondary age children too. Just yesterday, the English uh, Football League, the Premier League, were, were using the rainbow which has been claimed for these issues to say football must be for everyone. Well, of course football is for everyone. But football for everyone wearing a rainbow flag is football for homosexuals, etc., etc., etc. Why just include that group in society? I would be minded to say to the English Football Association that if somebody wants to watch a game of football at Arsenal, they need £97 to watch a home game. And I can think of a lot of people who are excluded from being able to follow football by the price of a ticket. How about the Football Association puts out messages about including people on low incomes or on no income and saying, let's include them in football. Why is it only one particular protected group within society who gets to wear the label of inclusion and of diversity. Where's the inclusion of Muslims? Where's the inclusion of Sikhs? Where's the inclusion of traditional Bible-following Christians in our society? Where's the day set aside in Parliament to discuss the persecution of Christians? A far bigger issue around the globe than the wicked harm that is done sometimes to homosexual people. Violence is wrong. But violence against anybody is wrong. We don't need to drape everything in a rainbow and obsess about one particular identity or group in society. So what I want to do in this message, reflecting on Genesis 2, I hope is not to push your buttons or to push the buttons of anyone who may listen to this message or to upset anyone. I want to acknowledge right from the beginning, this area of human sexuality is one that is shot through with pain for millions of people. And it is shot through with regret, and it is shot through with guilt, it is shot through with shame for millions of people, it is shot through with fear for millions of people. And that is not what God wants or what God intended. I want to have a grown-up conversation about why so many people are hurting. I'm not out with my Bible to bash anyone. And I'm not out with my Old Testament to mock anyone. I want to listen to God speaking to us and say, why is British society in pain? Why is global society in pain? Why is marriage falling apart? Why is society falling apart? Why are so many children strangers to their parents? Why so much hurt? Why violence in the domestic setting? Why cruelty between the sexes? I want to look at that because that's a real issue. So let's not get defensive. And let's not think, oh, he's talking about me. Or he's talking about somebody I know. I'm talking about me and you and everybody we know. The Word of God is alive. And the Word of God is like a sword and it cuts so it's going to cut me, and it's going to cut you. If the word pornography comes out of my mouth today, it's not because it's just a problem other people have, or a few people have. It's a huge issue for our culture, for our society, inside the church as well as outside the church. 
young people, middle-aged people, older people. This is about everybody. This is about our culture. So I want to talk about that pain, but I also want to talk about the truth of God, which is always good news. And you know what? It's inclusive good news. It's inclusive of everybody you'll ever meet. It's inclusive of people who define themselves as straight as a die and people who would never use that kind of language to describe themselves. This is the God who speaks to the human race. And the wonderful thing about Genesis chapters 1 to 3 is that it's written down by God for the whole human race. And whatever label or identity we may think fits us, God is speaking to us right here at the beginning. Is there pain? Is there guilt? Is there fear? Is there anger? God is speaking. And there is hope. And there is good news. Two things, two lessons today. Number one, sex is by God's design. Sex is by God's design. And I mean sex in the widest sense, not just of sexual activity, but of sex in the sense of maleness and the biology and the gender that goes along with being created male as a man and femaleness and the blessing and the gift of God in creating woman. I want to think about sex by God's design. And I also want to think then, secondly, about marriage, about a sexual relationship within a promise, within a, a, a bond, within a covenant created by God. Marriage as something by God's design. These two things are what we're going to explore. Sex is by God's design. Biological sex is God's idea. It's something that we find in most of creation. Animal life, plant life, go anywhere in the kingdom of living things and you will discover that God has this brilliant idea that he loves life to produce life and to be fertile. And he has given that fertility to pretty much everything in creation that is alive. And you will find that very, very commonly throughout creation, there are basically things that can be thought of as male and as female throughout the realm of living things. And especially when we look at our own race made in the image of God, God repeatedly says in his word that he created human beings in his image to be male and to be female. And in a sense that it is when we come together, males and females, and create families and, and are fruitful and fill the earth with more humans, that that is a special expression of what it means to be in the image of God. Because God is a family. God is a community. God is a God who gives himself in love. And he has designed our humanity for families. Not everyone will be married. Not everyone will have a child. Not everyone will be a mother or a father. But we are all someone's child. And we are all connected to the rest of the human race. And sex is part of reality in your life. You're a woman or you're a man. You're made in the image of God. You are an image bearer. You are made as a full human being. And gender and sexual desire and sexual joy and the cost of sex is something that the whole human race shares in common. Now, Genesis 2 is dealing with a world where there is no selfishness and no sin and no cheating and no lying and no affairs and, and all the rest of it. But it's so helpful to us living in a world 
that has gone wrong, to check the blueprint, to check the design, to check the Creator's intention. So, as you look at the blueprint, what's the first thing that strikes you? Well, there is something missing even in paradise. There is, to be more blunt, someone missing in paradise. God is teaching the first man, Adam, in whom he breathes his own breath to make man a living being, a living soul. The Bible uses the imagery of God taking a handful of the earth or a handful of dust and fashioning the man. And we, different people understand uh, the meaning of that in slightly different ways. Personally, I'm totally relaxed with it being taken at its bare-faced, most simple va level that God used all kinds of processes to bring about all kinds of things in creation. And some of that may have taken a great deal of time, but when he came to make the first man, I have no problem with a simple, straightforward reading. He took the substance of the earth. He took the carbon and the oxygen and all the rest of it, a little bit of iron, and he made a man in his own image and in his own likeness and to function as the ruler in the place of God as God's image in the world. God set up a being to be like him and to know him. But there is something missing. And God tells that image bearer, Adam, made out of the stuff of the dust, look at all the other living creatures, look at the birds, look at the animals, look at the domestic animals, look at the whole wonderful variety that is in nature. Understand it all. And notice, Adam, that they're all capable of reproducing. And notice, and I'm pretty sure that before God formed Adam and God formed Eve, that processes involving what we would think of as some creatures supporting the food chain and, and, and there being animal death, little things that live in your gut that are breaking down food. You know, there, there's a lot of death going on inside of us all the time in order to eat even a piece of fruit. But Adam is made free from the curse of death in the image of God in a world where every other living thing is reproducing. And he doesn't find any living thing that's like him, that he can know, that he can share his life with. The thing that's missing, it's spelt out in verse 20, for Adam no suitable helper was found. No one he could talk to, no one he could relate to, no one he could plan with, no one who could join him in ruling over and subduing creation and bringing more and more order and beauty and perfection into God's good world. There's longing there. There's a void, there's an emptiness. There's nobody suitable for the man. And if we're so deeply into our feminism that we find the phrase, there was no suitable helper found. If we find that offensive, do bear in mind that the Old Testament and the New Testament are perfectly relaxed about saying, the Lord is my helper, or asking the Lord, be my help, or thanking the Lord for being my help. If God can come to the help of the man, What's the problem with God creating another self, someone who is like Adam but different from Adam, to help him? They're going to help each other. They're going to complete each other. This is not sexism. This is not misogyny. This is just the poetic, grand, beautiful language of your maker and creator saying, this is what I did when I got the blueprints out. I made a man out of the stuff of the planet. He shares so much in common with the planet and the living creatures in the planet. And then I made a helper that was suitable for the man. 
and I made her specially by special creation, just as I made the man specially by special creation. And I took the woman, the other self, to complete the man out of the man. She's part of him. He's part of her. That's why they click so well. They're built for each other. They're built out of each other. And there'll be no more men without the woman. There'll be no more humans without the woman. And there'll be no more men. There'll be no more boys. There'll be no more girls. It takes Adam and Eve to produce the rest of the race. They're both essential. God wants them both to be partners and he brings them together. This is kind of a wedding, isn't it? The Lord God took the woman that he formed out of the side of the man. And he took the woman to the man. And suddenly his search for purpose and meaning in paradise had found what was missing. Eden is being designed and built by God to be a place where men and women make a home together with each other and with God. And there is something about the design of the garden that is, yes, we saw a few weeks ago, a place of worship, like a temple, but it is also a place where God wants us to be safe and relaxed and protected and ourselves. And ideally, human beings will find all that security when they find love with each other in families. And that love overflows from the love of God for us and the love that he pours into us for one another. God does not want us to be independent little islands. God wants us to be interdependent. God wants us to need each other. And you don't have to be married to need other human beings. If you are a widow, you can still be in families. If you are single, you can still be in families. But this is God's brilliant idea. Let's bring Adam and the woman together. The, the, the very words for the man and the woman and the names that are given to them. The word for a man in Hebrew is ish. The word for the woman taken out of the, the man is isha. Do you see how they sound like each other? The word for the man and the word for the woman. It works in English too. They sound like each other. They overlap. They belong together. Adam, his name makes you think of the earth that he was taken from. Eve, the mother of all living. So sex is God's grand design. Biology maleness, femaleness. Let's not rubbish these things. Let's not change them at a whim. Let's not push them away as if they don't matter. Let's not deconstruct humanity from the plan of God. Sex is by God's design. But the second idea is that marriage, that faithfulness, that loyalty, that lifelong faithfulness within a God-designed covenant for two people, of opposite sex, that matters. Marriage is by God's design. Will you notice with me what happens? There is no, here comes the bride playing. As Eve is taken to the man, he has come under the divine anesthetic. He's been put to sleep. And when he wakes up, he's missing part of himself. Part of his side is gone. The flesh has been closed over. Traditional translation, a rib. The NIV foot says, well, maybe his whole side was gone. It's, it's got to hurt, hasn't it? You've got to notice for the rest of your life that there's a bit of you missing, but something far better has been given to you. And Adam sees the woman, Eve, and it is put in his heart, and it is put in her heart. This is what we were made for. 
I'm sure they chose each other freely, but they were also there by the choice and plan of God. What's Jesus' commentary on all of this? On this two becoming one flesh, on this man and woman complementing one another and having sexual union as a a cement that binds them together and that gives them a bond that is permanent and deep, that is spiritual and emotional and physical, goes right into your guts. It aches. What's Jesus' commentary on it all? Those whom God has joined together, let no human being tear apart. This marriage bond is not something light. It's not something casual. It's not recreational sex. It's not no strings, meaningless sex. It is a man saying forever, you are my wife, my bride, and I am your husband, and I will be loyal, and I will love you, and serve you, and lead you, and represent God to you. And that woman saying to that man, I give myself to you and I will love you and rejoice with you and encourage you and help you and serve you. Yes, serve you. That's what people who love each other do. It's beautiful. I don't understand how anyone can get a head of steam up about the way the Bible describes a perfect symmetry. The New Testament does not deviate one iota from what Genesis 1 says about creation in the image of God, male and female, and what Genesis 2 says about the interdependence and the bond that God creates, the one flesh bond, no longer part of an old family. You leave father, you leave mother, you adhere to, you cleave to your spouse, the man to the wife, the wife to the man. And it's meant to be for life, and it's meant to be good, and it's meant to be safe, and it's meant to be loving, and it's meant to be kind. And God intends that this be the safe place for children to enter this world. It's a good plan. The most literal translation of what Adam says in his little poem that's recorded there in verse 23 goes something like this. This is the one, or this one, at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, for she was taken out of Ish. It's lovely. That's the one. The monkeys didn't do it for me, nor the kangaroos. That's the one. The fish, they weren't even close. The birds of the air, not. That's the one. I get it. God, you always had a plan. Oh God, you've got such a sense of humor. You made me wait for her, but I'm glad I waited. She's marvelous. She's wonderful. What a gift. Don't you think Genesis 2 might have more to teach us about a happy and successful society than the voices we hear from Facebook and Twitter and the internet and the films? Don't you think Hollywood maybe has got this wrong? Don't you think romantic fiction and soft pornography and not so soft pornography has got this completely wrong? This is the one. Bone of my bones. We're one. We're tight. We're close. We're one flesh. And we're going to build a world together and stick at it together and be loyal to each other. Now, the next chapter of Genesis. Story goes wrong. But these are the blueprints. I want to use a little illustration. It's a a helpful one. I find it helpful anyway. Christmas is coming. And you know what happens 
in many a house at Christmas, we blow the dust off the games that we rarely play and we get people around the table and we'll have a good game of Monopoly or Scrabble or whatever, whatever takes your fancy. And I'm sure in many a household, you will have time off work or you will have a bit more of a relaxed pace of life and you will say, I'm going to make a jigsaw. You got a jigsaw? 1,500 pieces? I stick to the 500 usually. Not very patient kind of man. My wife was looking at uh, Krispy Kreme donuts in Tesco the other day, and my eyes lit up until I saw it was a jigsaw. Six Krispy Kreme donuts that you can't eat at Christmas, and that's going to make everyone feel happy. She didn't buy it. But if I see a box that shape under the tree, I, I'll be in for a surprise. Krispy Kreme donuts with sprinkles, a jigsaw. But you know, every decent jigsaw comes with a box. And on the box is a picture of what those thousand or two thousand pieces are supposed to look like. How hard is it going to be to put all the bits of different colored Krispy Kreme donuts together? They're all the same shape. It'd be a nightmare. But if you've got the lid of the box, well, you can maybe begin to discern patterns and shapes and put it together. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is the lid of the box. It shows you in a world of pain, in a world where some people have had a terrible experience of sexual abuse, maybe in young years, and it has made every relationship painful or difficult or impossible. In a world where there is addiction to sin and where some people are addicted in the area of their sexuality and it is so hard to beat those addictions, in a world where there is pornography pouring out of mobile phones into the lives of young children, in a world where people have many things that they regret and they wish they could forget, but they cannot, how wonderful to recalibrate your heart and relearn what it is to love and relearn what it is to rejoice and relearn what it is to laugh and relearn what it is to be at peace and to have fun. Look at the top of the box. Look at the blueprint. Look at God's plan. That's the point in the Bible of Genesis 2 and later scriptures that comment on Genesis 2, like Paul in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church sacrificially, because now you're in a fallen world. Die a bit, husbands, for the sake of your wives so that they will thrive. Hus wives, love your husbands the way the church worships and reverences Christ. How countercultural is that? But boy, when men are dying for their wives and women love their husbands like they love their Lord, wow, that's dynamite. That's the lid of the box. But we find it easy to very quickly move to separation or divorce. 40% of marriages in the United Kingdom, in Scotland, are dissolved. 40%. Now, that still means that marriage is still by far the most successful relationship around and the most stable. But we need to pray and we need to work about the quality of the 60% of marriages and about the 40%. And we also need as churches to be concerned and teaching and praying and discipling about the huge numbers of people who never get a promise, who never get a formal marriage to dissolve. Because they're in a worse position than anybody else. God is not being a killjoy 
when he gives you the lid of the box. God is not saying, you, 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 I don't like fun, I don't want you to have fun. When he says, look at the lid of the box, God knows what produces joy. And self-sacrificial love that's permanent produces joy. Where do you want the children of Scotland to grow up? In informal relationships that last a few months? With no clue who dad is or who your sister or your brother's dad is? That's not healthy. Now, I've got repenting to do. Scotland's got repenting to do. You've got repenting to do. The church has got repenting to do. And I want a church with big, wide open arms that is inclusive of people who've got all of this wrong. So that people who are single parents or who are divorced or who are remarried and divorced can say, do you know what? That Christian family is the place where I need to be and I want to look at the top of the box. I want to look at the jigsaw the way it's meant to be and maybe it'll never be totally fixed in this life and maybe I've got scars of abuse and maybe I've got tears that just won't stop coming. But to know God, and to know a loving church family who are not judging me, who are not looking down on me, but a loving church family who say, let's look at the lid of the box. Let's look at God's blueprint together. And there, what will we discover? God is better than a husband. God is better than a wife. And God's love is secure even if you have been hurt, hurt, hurt to the core God's love is solid gold. Genesis 2 is brilliant. Genesis 3 cannot be ignored where it goes wrong even for Adam and Eve. So where are we going to finish this morning? I want to leave you with two thoughts. One is a thought for our whole society, our sex-obsessed society that seems to be able to think about and talk about little else. Do you know what the problem with sex is in the 21st century and really for the last 50 years where we have sought personal freedom and personal autonomy and we have sought personal greedy quick gratification without thinking about commitment and consequences? Do you know what our problem is? It's a problem of having the wrong God. It's a problem of idolatry. It's a problem of worshiping ourselves, and it's a problem of worshiping sex and sexual experience as if that was what really mattered or what really made us human. This Genesis 2 says to us, that sex is a poor substitute for God. Do not idolize relationships or anything that you are pursuing sexually if it's taking you away from the blueprints, the lid of the box. Repent. If your idol is a gender identity, if your idol is a sexual identity, if your idol is being beautiful or being young or being desired or whatever, repent. Sex is a poor substitute, a poor replacement for God. And the other thing is that sex is a really good signpost towards God and to find God, and to discover union with God. Because sex, according to the blueprints in Genesis 2, is not about me. It's not about self. It's not about what's good for me. It is about two becoming one for their mutual benefit and joy, and for mending society, because society is blessed and is stronger when there is good family life according to God's plan. 
what we're going to do, having looked at the top of the box, will either break society a little more and jumble up the pieces a little more, or it will mend society and put the pieces in the right places. Why do I say sex is a signpost towards our need of God and our need of community? Well, we don't find in ourselves enough. But we can't find in Eve or in Adam enough either. We find a signpost that a good and satisfying loving relationship, a good and satisfying marriage is a blessing from God, but it is a signpost of a deeper hunger for love and meaning, of a deeper need which is open to everyone here. Whatever our past and whatever our sins and whatever our marital status, God says, my son needs a bride, and he's better than Adam. And Adam was in a garden, and he gave up his side so that he could have a bride. And Jesus went to a garden, and boy, it was a very different garden. It wasn't a happy place. It was a miserable place where he fought for your salvation. But in that garden, thankfully, Jesus went to the cross where his side bears the marks of his love for his bride, and his bride is the redeemed church of the living God. His bride is any man, any woman, any sinner who calls on the name of the Lord. And I don't know if you're gay, and I don't know if you're whatever on the LGBTQI plus spectrum the side of Jesus Christ was torn for you to heal you, to save you, to wash you. Man or woman, old or young, the bridegroom you need is Jesus Christ. And you become his bride by repenting of your sins and believing the good news of the gospel. And there is a better than Eden, there is a better than God's garden in the future, which marriage always points forward to. Marriage is not the destination. Marriage is an illustration, a signpost of the destination. Single people, that destination is for you. Married people, that destination is for you. Divorced people, that destination is for you. Because Jesus says, come to me for meaning and salvation. Were you expecting that from a sermon called Sex in Paradise? That's good news. Scotland and the UK and Europe and the world need Genesis, and we need Jesus. Lord, forgive us and change us, and make our homes safe, and make our marriages and our loving bonds tender, and make Jesus the center of it all. Hear us, Lord, as we call on you and show us the Savior better than Adam, the man better than Adam, who calls his bride to his side so that they may be one and in union forever. Thank you for this glorious Bible and for the good news. Amen.